Hello everyone and welcome to Beyond the Veil, a class where we are focusing on the tabernacle and the temple while tracing the greater significant subject of the presence of God. Uh, today we're in lesson six on the altars of the patriarchs. Uh, thus far in our study we have looked at what the presence of God means to God's people, uh, how significant it is and ought to be to us. Uh, we've looked at in the past two lessons, the very first place God dwelt with his people uh, in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. And just how special that place was, how there was no there was no sin, there was no hiding, there was no shame. God was walking in the midst of, of Adam and Eve, and it was just a picture of perfection. But then Genesis 3 came, but then sin and rebellion came, and man was removed from the presence of God. Well, our study today fills the in-between time from Adam and Eve up to the tabernacle. And what we're looking at is how man communed with God, met with God, drew near to God, and that's through study of altars. You know, a fascinating thing about altars is that our English word for altar comes from a Hebrew verb root, which meant slaughter. And so an altar literally meant a place of slaughter. Uh, the purpose of these altars that the patriarchs would build is that they were places of sacrifice, but they were also places where they could draw near and call out on the name of the Lord. And so the purpose of this study is to trace five examples of patriarchs, of men of faith who built altars and to sort of notice what we what we can see about these about the altar themselves, about what their purpose was, but then what this has to do with our greater study of the presence of God. So let's dig in. We're going to start in Genesis chapter eight, and we're looking at our first example of Noah. Once the ark comes to rest and the waters have subsided, and Genesis chapter 8, we're going to pick up in verse 13. It says, It came about in the 600, 601st year, in the first month, on the first of the month, the water was dried up from the earth. Then Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the surface of the ground was dried up. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dry. And God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that, that they may be that they may breed abundantly on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So no one out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by their families from the ark. Look at verse 20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. The Lord smelled the soothing aroma, and the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth, and I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. So just a couple things here to notice. So the ark finally lands on ground. The water has, has subsided, the ark lands, and Noah's able to exit the ark. And the first thing he does is he builds this altar. Now that tells us something. Now up to this point, we've seen man sacrifice to God. You might make the case that in the garden was the first sacrifice. Adam and Eve had, had clothed themselves with fig leaves that they sewed together, but it was obvious it wasn't adequate enough. And so God made for them animal clothing. What we, we might assume, though we don't know completely, but we might assume that God slaughtered animals in their presence to cover up their nakedness. Whether that is the case or not, we do know in Genesis chapter 4 that the children of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, they come and they are bringing their sacrifices to God in the form of worship. Cain brings from the ground, from his, his vegetables and his fruit, and Abel brings brings a lamb. And so they were taught by mom and dad. At that time, it was well understood, this idea of bringing an offering, a sacrifice to God. 
And so Noah, all these generations later, knows about sacrifices, knows about offerings, knows about building an altar to the Lord, because the first thing he does once he exits the ark is that he builds this altar and he offers clean animals to the Lord. And so it's not just that he knows about giving of something to the Lord or giving what you have, burning something to the Lord, but this idea of giving your best, the clean animals he's offering to the Lord. You also notice in verse 21 that the Lord smelled the burnt author, smelled the soothing aroma. And so this idea that it was well-pleasing to the Lord. And God was, was well-pleased with this demonstration of worship and devotion from Noah. So an interesting moment here from, from Noah, one of the first mentions of an altar that we read of, Noah signifying his his worship of God, his devotion of God, and perhaps we might even just say his, his praise and thanksgiving to God, having been delivered from this immense uh, judgment in the flood. Our next account takes us to Genesis 12, and we're reading of Abraham here, or at this point in his life. Um, his name is, is Abram. But in Genesis chapter 12, we read a lot of occasions. You see it on, this, on the uh, screen there. Genesis 12, Genesis 13, Genesis 18, and then uh, or Genesis 22. It makes the point already that through Abraham's life, he had um, developed a custom, the habit of worshiping God all through his travels. That, that's what Abraham's known as, is, is the man who journeyed. Uh, he didn't really know where he was going, although God had given them the promise of this promised land. But Abraham, this this pilgrim who journeyed a lot of different places, would along his life's journey make these these altars and worship the Lord. So one example here is in Genesis 12. We're not going to read all these verses today. I'll let you read them on the screen, but I'll just make a few a few notes as we go along. So here in Genesis 12, in verse seven. It says, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Then he proceeded from there to the mountain east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. It's two things. So verse seven, God makes a promise to Abraham, promise about the land, giving this, this, this promised land to Abram. And Abram responds to God's promise by building an altar. And then you find verse 8, that he travels to this land east of Bethel. And once he gets there, he builds an altar. But you notice what's tagged at the end of that verse, in verse 8. He built an altar, and he calls upon the name of the Lord. Notice that as we keep on reading through these different passages, there's an association between building the altar and calling on the name of the Lord. You see, it wasn't just a form of worship, and it was, uh, or a a form of devotion. It was man's way of seeking the presence of God or drawing near to God. Here, Here is Abram, and he is calling out on the name of the Lord, seeking his favor, seeking his um, his praise or seeking his his blessings. We see in chapter 13, the next chapter over, when you look at verse 2 through 4, says, Now Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and gold, and he went on his journeys from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there formerly. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. So you just notice another detail. Again, you see the fact that's where Abram called on the Lord. So he did it again here in verse 4. But you notice he didn't take it down. He did not take the altar down. It stood there. And so another feature of these altars is that they would be these uh, monuments of remembrance. You come back to this place and Abraham remembers, that's where I called on the Lord before. I sought the Lord here. And then returning to this place in verse 4, he calls on the Lord again. And so you have these visual reminders of times when man sought the Lord scattered all over, especially in Abraham's journey. Go down to verse 18 of this context. It says, Then Abraham moved his tent and came to dwell by the oaks of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and there he built an altar to the Lord. Same kind of thing. Uh, In verse 17 of the context, God makes a promise again. I'm going to give you this land. 
And Abraham's response to the promise of God is to build the altar, is to build a place to, to honor and glorify God. God speaks, Abraham obeys and builds the altar. And chapter 22, chapter 22 is, is, it is a memorable uh, event in the life of Abraham because it's the time when God tells Abram, or at this point Abraham, to take the son of promise, to take Isaac, and to go and to sacrifice him. So here's what's, what's so significant about this scene, is that God tells him to sacrifice Isaac on the altar. So God is initiating this altar moment, and he, he designates what's to be sacrificed. It's not an animal, which would be costly enough, but it's your own son, your own son. It is an immense test of Abraham's faith. Um, who do you love more? As you look at verse 1, it says, It came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, he said, Here I am. He said, Take now your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on the mountains, on one of the mountains, which I will tell you. It's this incredible test of God in which he is essentially asking Abraham, Who do you love more? I gave you this son, this, this only son whom you love. But who do you love more? Do you love me enough to give up what means the most to you? That's, that's a question I think each of us will need to ask ourselves at some point. Am I really willing to abandon all for God? If he asks it, if he would demand it, would I give up everything that I have for him? Do I truly love him more than anything else? Well, they go on their way, but you notice in verse 7, as they're going along the way, Abraham in verse 6 has the wood, he has the knife, he and Isaac are going along together, and Isaac spoke to Abraham, he says, my father, and he said, here I am, my son, and he said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham saying, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. So just a, a feature here, just as Noah knew about offerings and altars, telling us that whatever Adam had taught Cain and Abel, it was taught and passed along generation to generation. Well, here, Abraham had already instilled the knowledge of altars and sacrifices and worship to his son Isaac because they're heading up that way. And Isaac says, hmm, there's something really important missing here. You have to imagine the conversation between a father and son. <laughs> the father knowing it's going to be his son and the son thinking, hmm, something's missing. Something's missing here. Once everything happens and God steals Abraham's hand from slaying his son. In verse 13, he sees Abraham sees the ram caught in a thicket. He takes the, the ram. He offers him as a burnt offering in the place of his son. And in verse 14, Abraham called the name of that place. The Lord will provide as it is said this day in the mount of the Lord. It will be provided. And so you see. More, more features of what took place at these altars. The idea of sacrifice, burnt offering. And so God's people knew early on about this idea of sacrifice, of the, the cost of sin, death, and blood, and what it took to, to cover, uh, to cleanse from sin. <clears throat> you see, uh, at least here from Abraham's story, what it was meant to cost each person. I mean, Abraham was asked to give what his most precious uh, person thing in his life for God. But you also see that he not only has Abraham set up these, these altars along the way and remembers what has happened at each one. Here he names the place so that when he comes back by this mountain again or his descendants come back by this again, it is attributed to a specific moment in his life meant to recall a time when God has provided for his people. And so these altars, again, they're, they're places of worship, they're places of devotion, they're places where man calls out to be in the presence of God. And here, they're, they're places to um, bring about a remembrance in the people's minds of when man has approached God, or in this case, when God has, has done something significant in the lives of his people. And so at least up to this point, what we see about altars as well is that they are also places of intercession. There I'll call out on the name of the Lord. I'll seek the Lord 
And from Abraham's perspective in chapter 22, I sought the Lord and he provided. I sought the Lord in obedience. I sought the Lord through worship. And he provided the answer. He provided deliverance. He provided redemption, if you will, for Isaac, providing a ram in his, in, in his place. So the altars were a place of intercession. They were a place of worship. They were a place of remembrance. If you go to chapter 26 of the book of Genesis, once Abraham has died, Isaac receives a promise from the Lord. In Genesis 26, looking at verse 23, speaking of Isaac, it says, Then he went up from there to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. So he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there, and Isaac's servants dug a well. The same kind of thing, very similar to Abraham's. God makes a promise to Isaac, and Isaac's response is to build an altar, to build an altar to the Lord. And so, again, it is this response of a response of God's goodness, a response of God's favor. Might we even just say it's a response of God's revelation. God speaks. God, God comes to man. He gives a promise, and man's response is, I'm going to worship. I'm going to devotion. I'm going to sacrifice to God. I'm going to praise him. God has just spoke to me. He just gave a promise to me, and so I'm going to worship him and, and um, turn to him, seek him, call on his name. We see one more similar occasion with uh, Jacob, Isaac's, one of Isaac's sons, Jacob, in Genesis chapter 33. It's a long context. We're not going to read it all here. Uh, if you know the story of Jacob and Esau, this is the, the end of that story. Uh, Jacob has, in a sense, just ruined Esau's life tricking him out of his birthright, uh, tricking him out of his his favor from um, his father, the, the promise from the father, firstborn. And so Jacob leaves. Esau wanted to kill him. Jacob leaves, and time passes. He gets married. He has all of his children. And then after all these years, Jacob is finally leaving from where he had lived for a long time with his father-in-law. And it comes about that Esau wants to meet up with them. They're going to cross paths, and Esau wants to meet up with them. And Jacob is terrified because in his mind, the last time he saw Esau, Esau wanted to kill him. And so Jacob has a moment the night before he meets Esau with God. It's an incredible scene where Jacob wrestles with God, and he holds him down, and he tries to get a blessing from him, and God changes his name to, to Israel. Well, the next day then, he meets Esau, and surprising to everyone who reads it, everything's fine. Esau is very gracious. Uh, he's just pleased to see his brother, and the two have a, have a kind of a, a kind moment together, and then they just part ways. Well, at the end of the context, in Genesis 33, at verse 18, it says, Now Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padan Aram. And camped before the city, he bought the piece of land which, uh, where, where he had pitched his tent from the hands of the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, for 100 pieces of money. Then he erected there an altar and called it El Elhoi Israel. That's just it. And so Jacob makes it through that scene safely. He buys a piece of land, and as soon as he occupies the land, the first thing he does is he builds an altar. Which tells us something, that perhaps the, the purpose of him building an altar at this moment, right here in verse 20, is, you, you know, it's El, 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 El Israel. I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I don't know how to pronounce it. These are my notes. The, the pronounce or the, uh, the meaning of those words is God, the God of Israel. Jacob makes it through safely. He purchases this land, and his first response is to build an altar to God. And, it, and the name of that altar is, God is the God of Israel. Again, Israel is not a nation. Right now, Israel is a person. God is my God. God has delivered me. God kept me safe. God has uh, protected me from my brother. And so from him seeing me through, 
from him delivering me, from he, from, from him allowing me to be where I am right now, his first response, I'm going to praise the Lord. That's a lot like Noah. Noah gets off the ark from this incredible uh, world catastrophic judgment. And his first response is, I'm going to build an altar and praise the Lord. That's what Jacob does here. God saved his life. I'm going to worship and I'm going to, I'm going to build an altar to the Lord. And like Abraham in Genesis 22, here Jacob names it. He names the altar, bringing a specific remembrance to those who would come and see this. One other occasion in Genesis 35, uh, beginning of verse 1, God says to Jacob, Arise and go to Bethel and live there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob and his household, uh, Jacob said to his household and all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods which are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments. And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods which they had and the rings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak which was near Shechem. So a few other details here about, about, um, about altars. One very similar to chapter 33 this is an altar that comes out of response to what God has done for him in the Esau incident. But you notice here, this is God initiating this altar. This isn't man saying, I'm going to do this out of response to what God has done. God commands it. I want you to go and I want you to build this altar because of what I did for you. What you also see is the preparation in verse 2. Jacob commands his household to prepare themselves for this building of the altar. And so there's two things he tells them to do. He says, one, they are to put away all the foreign gods, and two, they are to purify themselves, to change their garments. Full cleansing. Now think about that. If an altar is a way that man is drawing near to God and seeking his presence, calling on the name of the Lord, and to draw near to God always requires a sense of cleansing and purity. You cannot draw near to God defiled. You cannot draw near to a holy God while living in darkness or in sin. There has to be a cleansing. There has to be a, a purification. Okay. We'll, we'll see that as we get to the tabernacle and all the, the commandments and restrictions for the priest and how the priests were supposed to, to wash and cleanse themselves before they entered into the actual tent or into the temple. Well, here we, we, we see just a form of that. If you're going to draw near and worship me and build this altar, We've got to put away all these false gods, all these foreign gods, and anything attached to them. The jewelry, all of it's got to be put away. But then two, we're going to cleanse ourselves. We're going to purify ourselves. We're going to wash ourselves so that we may draw near, clean, pure, whole, holy to the Lord. And then you also see that this altar from verse 1 and in verse 3, is a response in worship to what God has done. God who answered me in the day of my, dis of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. It's a response. It's a response of, of who God is and what he has done. Now, I want to look at one more. One more, and then we'll, we'll kind of wrap this up. Go over now to the book of Exodus. This is getting really close to the tabernacle now. This is Exodus 17. Moses is, as who we're reading up here, Moses and Israel, they have left Egypt. The, the plagues are over, they've crossed the Red Sea, and they have begun their wilderness journey. And they're heading towards Sinai, just as a stop before they head towards the Promised Land. Well, in Exodus chapter 17, we, we find this occasion from verse 8 to 16 that they battle against Amalek. And I'm sure you remember this scene. Amalek battles against the army of Israel. And so long as Moses holds up his hands, they're winning. But if he does for a long time, he gets really tiring. And so he has to have Aaron and her help hold up his hands. Well, so long as he holds up his hands, they win. And so God gives them the victory over Amalek. Well, once that's done, we're looking here in Exodus 17. Look down at verse 14. It says, The Lord said to Moses, Write this in a book as a memorial and recite it to Joshua that I will utterly destroy or utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and named it the Lord is my banner. 
And he said, the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war against Amalek from generation to generation. It's sort of a collection of everything we've seen up to this point. God gives victory. God delivers them from, from the enemy. And he tells Moses, I want you to write it down. Write it down in the book. And this is specifically for Joshua. Joshua is going to need a remembrance of victory against, against incredible odds, against, against your enemies from the past, because I have some big plan for him in the future. But in verse 15, Moses it's not just not to write it in a book. Moses builds an altar, and then he names it. He's a tribute to the Lord is our banner. We are under his kingdom. We are his people. And so, again, you, you see this idea of, of worship, of thanks, and devotion, and a response to what God has done uh, to and for his people. When you look, go over two chapters to Exodus chapter 20. In Exodus 20 and verse 22 the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen that I have spoken to you from heaven. You shall not make other gods beside me, gods of silver or gods of gold. You shall not make for yourselves. You shall not make an altar of earth for me. You shall sacrifice, or you shall make an altar of earth for me, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. And every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and I will bless you. If you make an altar of stone for me, you shall not build it of cut stones. For if you wield your tool on it, you will profane it. And you shall not go by steps to my altar that your nakedness be not exposed on it. It's this idea that I will come to you and I will bless you. I will come near and I will bless you. Down there in verse 22. God is approaching his people. God is, is desiring to draw near. And so this section, as we just kind of studied, fills in the gap and answers the question. God had an immense plan for his people in Genesis 2 and 3. He built the garden. He provided for man. He placed man in the garden, and he walked among their midst in the garden. But then because of sin and rebellion, all that was lost. So the question we have in response to that is, well, what, what's going to happen next? Is that it? Is there any hope for man to draw near to God and for God to be with man and for them to have this fellowship, for man to be able to enter into to God's presence? And so for all these years, this is what took place. Man sought the Lord and he sought him not just in one place. All through their journeys, as you see, as you see here on the screen, especially even Abraham or Jacob, all their journeys, when God saved them and delivered them and provided for them and gave promises to them, man called on the name of the Lord. Man sought the name or the face or the presence of the Lord through bringing an offering of worship and praise and devotion from Jacob's perspective of cleansing and themselves of all their defilement, of all their sin. They, they made it their approach, their, their, their way. Their, they made their their aim to approach the presence of God. Some of this was God-directed, and some of it was, was man-initiated. All of it must have been God-commanded from the very beginning. How would they have known about animal sacrifices had God not given a command or an instruction? Hebrews 11 and verse uh, 4 and 5 tells us about Cain, or Abel, Abel, excuse me, tells us about Abel, and how his offering was by faith. Well, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so God must have directed the worship that was done. And so all along the way, just like in Genesis uh, 2 and 3, God provides the way for man to be in his presence. God built the garden. He put man in. And here God gives direction about offerings and sacrifices and even alters himself as a way for man to draw near to him and approach him to call upon his name and worship him. And as we'll see in our next study, it's not going to be long now. And God's going to give some specific orders about a actual dwelling place, a tent among the people, and how significant that was to be for them. Thank you so much for, for following along in the study. I uh, hope it was encouraging to you. If you have any questions or any, any things that are uh, running through your mind that you want to talk further about, just leave a, leave a question or leave a comment on our website under the Contact Us page, and I'll see that. And, uh, and I'll try and get together with you through email. We can talk about it further. 
Thank you so much for studying with me. Have a blessed day. Hope to see you soon.